so a very good evening to all and uh, welcome to this session of <clears throat> uh, journal club of iap toronto so this is the eighth episode of uh, iap toronto's journal club we are very happy to tell that uh, after it has been, it has started since um, few months back we have included almost all the teaching institutions in uh, tirunelveli district like prs hospital sat hospital we started with the prs hospital with patnavan sir uh, sat hospital kims uh, gokulam hospital uh, gokulam medical college karakonam anandapuri cosmo and uh, also we were blessed with the uh, many uh, senior uh, teachers uh, who were uh, involved in each of these uh, general club sessions like sulfi sir and today we have kunju sir with us and uh, the idea of the iap uh, general club we were uh, trying to uh, brush up the and update uh, brush up and update the uh, knowledge academic knowledge of um, practicing pediatricians pgs faculties and all other uh, pediatricians regarding the recent advances in uh, uh, pediatrics uh, we were updating these things and we were including national and international index journals uh, recent articles Uh, recent advances for pgs that also was dealt with was one of the intention of uh, this uh, general club on paper is there so they could also prepare well we are trying to uh, keep the quality and uh, we are regularly doing it every month uh, with us uh, our uh, constant uh, i mean uh, one of the constant uh, team member is none other than dr v ramkutty sir sir is emeritus professor and was senior grade pro grade professor and research the official at achudamenon center for health science studies sri tirudirunal institute of medical sciences sir uh, began as we know uh, his he began his career as lecturer in pediatrics at medical college thrissur sir has supervised phd's in public health awarded five guiding currently six guided more than 25 masters dissertations sir is a member of the international epidemiological association is a fellow of the international academy of cardiovascular sciences and sir has been pivotal in preventing the non communicable diseases control program in kerala and sir is advisor of the kerala state planning board also and our general club iap has uh, the main coordinator as dr padmanabhan sir sir is presently working as a senior consultant in pediatrics at prs hospital sir has experience in pediatric oncology sir has worked abroad in different hospitals including teaching hospitals sir has teaching experience in medical college trivandrum and alp sir was in, in, sir is involved in research projects papers published in index and local international journals and uh, today we have none other than uh, our great teacher dr uh, kunju sir mohammad kunju sir sir uh, is presently working as a senior consultant at kims uh, in pediatric neurology sir is a teacher par excellence uh, uh, sir is very gentle loving and caring for his students sir is a great academician with various research works and publications sir is an amazing clinician and a touching doctor to the patients sir has a voracious reading habit and is an epitome of humility also sir has decorated high official posts in iap and national and international neurology associations today we have very interesting and uh, i mean very extensive uh, uh, article uh, presented by none other than the dm candidate from uh, medical college tirunelveli madam his name is uh, dr asmi habib madam madam is a senior resident dm pediatric neurology gmc tirunelveli before going on to the proper problem program i would like to uh, invite dr uh, sir riyas sir was here but uh, sir, dr riyas sir previous neb member and higher senior iap uh, official to talk a few words to us dr riyas sir i think riyas sir is uh, probably communicating with me madam um ah, dr patnal sir has joined and i would like to request dr patnal sir to share a few thoughts before we go into the uh, program talk uh, normally it's a pediatric topic and i come in as a expert today i would rather keep my mouth shut they will pass the baton to the next person this is not my cup of tea anyway so before we, we open the uh, topic proper i would request dr kunju sir to um, share a few words on the program the article and uh, everything related kunju sir please sir my uh, senior uh, friends dr ramguti dr patnapan 
uh, my colleagues and students, Riaz, uh, Anju, who, and all, the, all others uh, today. I'm happy to be a part of uh, this uh, general club of uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Trivandrum branch. Uh, even though Padnamhin uh, was telling that uh, the, the topic is not his uh, cup of co uh, coffee, but I think uh, definitely uh, at the end, you all will see how uh, uh, he will come out with a uh, uh, lot of ideas and criticism about the uh, about the paper because what I think what I have perceived uh, about the presentation is that we are uh, trying to uh, iron out the problems uh, as well as the mode of uh, operations as well as the mode of uh, conduct of the study rather than the content of the uh, uh, paper. So yes. that way I think uh, definitely Dr. Padmanabhan and others will be able to contribute and uh, I shall uh, definitely uh, try to contribute towards the Contents, if uh, needed. Yeah, I think uh, we can uh, start the program. Uh, before that, I request Dr. Ramanguti to uh, say a few words uh, about the uh, journal as well as uh, the, uh, the intent of this presentation. Thank you. I, I do. I mean, I think I'll reserve my comments to after the presentation briefly. This is a clinical trial with three groups, uh, and that is the interesting part. Uh, and there are <clears throat> there is also a time element because they are repeatedly measuring something and then comparing. So, from the methodology point of view, it uh, offers uh, certain challenges, which I think I'll discuss after the paper has been presented. Thank you, sir. Over to Dr. Aspis, madam. Can you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sir, is my uh, screen visible? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, IAP Truvandrum and my mentor, Professor Dr. Mimi, madam, for giving me this opportunity. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here. So the journal I'm going to present is effect of different corticosteroid dosing regimens on the clinical outcome of boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It is a randomized clinical trial which was published in JAMA Neurology in April 15, 2022. The, was, the corresponding author of this journal is Michela Gugleri, who is based in John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Center in Newcastle. They are also part of the four DMD investigators of the muscle study group. That is a group which intends to find out the optimum steroid regimen, that is the acronym four. And they were supported by the NIMS group, that is the National Institute of uh, Neurological Disorder and Stroke Society. So going to a brief background about the disease, it is caused by variants in dystrophin gene. So DMD is one of the most common childhood neuromuscular disorder with a birth incidence of one in 5,000 to 6,000 live male births. So corticosteroids, both prednisone and deflesacort, have now been approved for DMD. That is, they are already being approved because of the various mechanisms of action. So the recent recommendation is to use steroid from four to five years of age, not before two years of age. So the role of steroids in DMD is decrease in inflammation, increase mm -hmm. in mu muscle strength and muscle mass. Mm -hmm. This is implicated probably by the stimulation of insulin-like growth factors, decrease in cytokines, decrease in lymphocyte production, and proliferation of myofibroblast. But along with that, there are also side effects to these steroids because of the additional mineralocorticoid activity, which leads to weight gain, skin atrophy, and fluid retention. So brushing up few trials which have studied steroids in DMD, one of the major study which started uh, steroids in DMD was any, the article which was published in NEGM in 1985 uh, by Mendel et al. It was a double-blind RCT trial which studied different regimes of prednisone in one or three boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So they were assigned into three limbs, prednisone at 0.75 mg per kg per day, prednisone at 1.5 mg per kg per day or placebo. And it found out that prednisone, both the groups had significant improvement with regard to muscle function. 
The next major study which came was published in Neurology 2016 by Griggs et al. This time, it was a comparison between prednisone versus deflacercord versus placebo. And they were assigned into four limbs, two limbs with different dosages of deflacercord at 0.9 and 1.2 mg per kg per day, prednisolone at 0.75 mg per kg per day and placebo. So this trial lasted for 12 weeks. And it found out that daily use of both deflacercord and prednisone associated with better muscle strength. And this study also implicated that deflacercord was associated with lesser weight gain compared, compared to prednisone. And then there was yet another study which compared prednisone with deflacercord by Bonifatti et al. Again, they found out that it was equally effective, but deflacercord had lesser side effect. Another study compared a weakened regime of prednisone with daily regime of prednisone. This study lasted for one year. And they found out that the efficacy as well as the safety profile of both the weekend as well as the daily regimens were comparable, both in efficacy as well as safety. So now uh, steroid is an approved therapy and the latest study regarding steroid is the open label study design. It is a two year long, long term extension study, this time with a molecule called Vamorolone. This is a synthetic steroid molecule, which is supposed to have lesser side effects, and they assigned it to three, four different limbs of different dosages of amarillon, and they found out that there was no significant change in the stand velocity type. There is a supine to the standing velocity, but there was improved muscle function and grade comparable to glucocorticoids. So they compared glucocorticoid efficacy based on the previous literature, and they found out that the muscle function was comparable to glucocorticoid and had better safety outcome compared to glucocorticoid. Um, the other clinical trials are, one is Atalorin, which is used in nonsense mutations. Uh, it is not FDA approved, but approved in European uh, centers. Antisense oligonucleotide, a lot of antisense oligonucleotides are still in trials. The three molecules FDA approved is etalipersin, golodesin and vitolacin, which targets exon 53 for golodesin and vitolacin and exon 51 for etalipersin. So now coming to the main study, this is an international multicentric double blind parallel group RCT, which tries to compare three of the most frequently prescribed corticosteroid regimens in terms of both their long-term efficacy and adverse effects in boys with DMD who have not been treated with corticosteroids. So the three main regimens used in this trial are 0.75 mg per kg per day of daily prednisone, 0.9 mg per kg per day of daily deflacercord. So these two are daily regimens. And the third regimen is the intermittent prednisone regimen where prednisone is given at 0.75 mg per kg for 10 days and then given off days for the next 10 days. So the main aim of this study was to reach a consensus on the ideal dose and regimen of steroids. So they had three primary objective variables. Uh, one was the rise from the floor velocity, which is given as a reciprocal of time to rise from the floor, given by the measure rise per seconds. The other two parameters are measures of function. That is forced vital capacity measured in liters, and global treatment satisfaction scale, which is a measure of satisfaction, which is measured by the TSQM or the treatment satisfaction questionnaire for medication. So these three are the three main objective variables. The null hypothesis of this study is that the three corticosteroid regimens do not differ from each other with regard to any three dimensions of outcome. And each averaged across all follow-up visits after baseline through three years. There are multiple secondary efficacy variables that were measured, a 10 meter walk or run velocity, the North Star ambulatory assessment total score, distance for six minute walk test. So these three assess motor functions of the child, the TSQM effectiveness subscale scores, angle range of motion, pediatric specific quality of life score was measured using pediatric specific scale, cardiac function was measured, using left ventricle ejection fraction and fractional shortening. 
also the time from baseline visit to disease milestone. There were some secondary safety variables also which was measured. That is occurrence and severity of adverse effects and vertebral fracture. Along with that, additional safety outcome measures were assessed like height, weight, vital signs, behavioral rating scale, TSQ and subscales, data regarding lab abnormalities were also collected. So they had published most of the individual data, the scales in detail in the supplementary data. So this is again taken from the supplementary data which they had provided. So these are the main scales which they had used for the assessment of all the secondary outcome variables. This is the North Star ambulatory test, the TSQM subscales, the pediatric uh, quality of life, uh, revised RATA focuses on the emotional distress. So the sample size, initially the sample size was 100 participants per group, that is 300 in total, chosen by simulation to provide more than 80% each power to detect difference of approximately 0.5 standard deviation for at least two components of the three outcome between any of the two treatment groups. And they used O'Brien ordinary less squares method and a two tail significance level of 1.7 percentage. And uh, the simulations were performed using various correlations. And they had anticipated a participant withdrawal of 10 percentage. So they had done an interim analysis of 90 children after 12 months and they found out that the enrollment had been slow. So they reduced the sample size, which was from 300 to 225 children. Now the study subjects were boys with DMD who was never treated with steroids, recruited from 32 clinical sites from five different countries, that is Canada, Germany, Italy, UK, and USA. And these boys had to be genetically confirmed with DMD between the age group of four to eight years at the time of screening. They also had to be self-ambulatory. That is, they should be able to get up from the sitting position. And this study did not use a placebo group because the practice guidelines for DMD already recommends a corticosteroid treatment. This regimen, this, uh, this study just tries to find out the optimal dose and regimen. So a protocol and all of the amendments approved by the Institutional Review Board or Research Ethics Committee at each study site, written consent from parent or legal guardian and assent from the participants were obtained before initiating the study and evaluation. So the boys who were eligible were randomized in one is to one is to one ratio to receive either of the three drug dose regimens. And this randomization was done by computer. So the interventions and blinding, a clinical trial supply company, Cattle Limited, manufactured three identical tablets of prednisone, deflacicot, and placebo. So the placebo tablets were used in the intermittent prednisone regime uh, for the off days to maintain blinding during the off days. So these tablets were provided in a 20-day treatment wallet and the number of tablets ranged between two to six. And that depended upon the weight band dosage, which I'll be showing in the next slide. And the dosage reduction could be done if adverse effects are documented. So they had uh, properly defined adverse effects and the dose modification in the supplementary data. So if they encounter any adverse effects, they could reduce the dose. So this was the weight band. And as we can see, the number of tablets ranged from two to six. Uh, 5 mg of prednisone is equivalent to 6 mg of deflacicot. And this was the dosage according to the weight band. Coming to evaluation and follow-up, all the boys were followed up for minimum of three years while taking the study medications. This was the uh, initial uh, study plan. And the initial screening has to be done within the first three months. Then the follow-up was done at three months. The next follow-up at six months. And thereafter, every six months till the end of evaluation. So they had done proper adverse events reporting also, uh, which was recorded at each clinical assessment either by the prompting of the parents, the legal guardians, or both. And they had properly graded the severity of the adverse effects, ranging from mild or grade one, which does not require any medical intervention, to grade five, that is fatal. So they had properly provided uh, guidelines. So there are certain um, adverse effects, like Cushingoid features or glycosuria, for which there are proper consensus guidelines. 
So such cases, consensus guidelines for DMD was followed. If there was a corticosteroid associated adverse effect, however, if they encounter side effects for areas which lack clear recommendation, expert opinion was sought and consensus was reached among the investigators. So total p values were used for the comparison of two head-to-head -head evaluation, and the total the significance level was kept at 017. And analysis was performed using the SA software version 9.4. Now, during the delay in recruitment, the enrollment had to be further halted at 196. So the initial target was 290, 300, which came down to 290, 225. And ultimately, the randomization, the boys num number was just 196. So the initial plan was 65 randomized to daily prednisone. 65 to daily deflasacot and 66 to intermittent prednisone. So this is the uh, chart which they have provided. So initially 229 boys were assessed for eligibility and proper informed consent was signed by parent or legal guardian, out of which 33 had to be excluded due to multiple reasons like refusal to participate, unable to rise independently from floor, which is one of the exclusion criteria, unable to maintain proper reproducible force vital capacity and when they did not get a proper genetic diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this brought down the number to 196. So this was 65, 65 in the daily deflasacot group and 66 in the intermittent prednisone group. Again, there was a withdrawal. There were six children who were withdrawn. So this brought down the number to 62 in the primary analysis of daily prednisone. 63 in the daily deflasacot group and 65 in the intermittent prednisone group. Uh, but not all the children could complete the three-year time period. That is, 54 completed the um, three-year follow-up period in the daily prednisone, 54 in the daily deflasacot, and 56 in the intermittent prednisone. There was also some few withdrawals, which um, they have not mentioned exactly at one point these withdrawal scale. So this was the outline, uh, 196 patient was randomized out of which 190 patients were ultimately analyzed. So this was the baseline characteristics of the trial participants. Most of the traits were comparable between the three groups. The mean age was 5.8, uh, intermittent prednisone also it was 5.9. So more or less the baseline characteristics of the trial participants were matching. Uh, there was some uh, differences in the race predilection because daily prednisone group had 91 percentage of children who are whites, daily deflasacot had 89 percentage who were white children and intermittent prednisone had 74 percentage of children who were whites. So other than that they were able to fairly match almost all the baseline traits. So coming to the primary outcome as I've already mentioned these three were the three primary outcome variables rise from the floor velocity, post vital capacity, and the TSQ global satisfaction scale. So they had a head-to-head -head comparison between the two groups, out of which there was a significant difference noted for the rise, to flo rise from floor velocity. Uh, not between the daily prednisone and daily deflasacot accord group, they could not find any significant difference, but between daily prednisone versus the intermittent prednisone, they found out that the performance of daily prednisone was significantly better compared to the intermittent prednisone group. And also the significant difference in the rise from the floor velocity, that is better performance was noted in the daily deflasacot compared to intermittent prednisone. So the daily regimens comparing significantly better with respect to rise from floor velocity when compared to the intermittent prednisone group. In the other two parameters, there was no significant difference noted when there was a head-to-head -head comparison between the two groups. So this is the whisker box plot which they have um, plotted. So the blue indicates daily prednisone, the light orange is the daily deflasacot and the light gray is the intermittent prednisone. So we can see that the daily prednisone and the daily deflasacot, this is the time scale along the x-axis and this is the rise from the floor velocity rise per second uh, along the y-axis. So we can see that the lines of daily prednisone and daily deflasacot are definitely up. So this is the 
25th, as we all know, this is the Visca book. Uh, this is the 25th, 50th, and 75th um, quartile, and this is the range, and this is the outliers. And in this chart, we can see that the intermittent redness are definitely lagging below the other two groups, and this was a significant difference. Coming to the other primary outcome variables, as I've already mentioned, we can say that the three lines are more or less overlapping with each other. There is no significant difference that could be demonstrated with respect to forced vital capacity, as well as the TSQM, Global Satisfaction Subscale Score. So this was the uh, primary outcome variables. Now they had studied a lot of secondary outcome variables. Now in the uh, motor uh, milestones, that is the 10 meter walk test, the North Star ambulatory assessment, six minute walk test. Again, significant difference was noted between the daily prednisone versus intermittent prednisone, defl and deflasacord versus the intermittent prednisone. That is the deflasacord, daily regimens of deflasacord and daily regimen of prednisone was significantly better compared to the intermittent prednisone group. However, uh, on head-to-head -head comparison between the two daily regimes, there was no significant difference. No significant difference was noted with respect to the other scales. That is the range of uh, ankle range of motion, the quality of life, the behavioral scores, the cardiac functioning. They could not show any significant difference between any of the three regimes. Uh, another um, a study of interest uh, was the safety profiles with regard to the three regimens. So in the weight gain, they noticed that with uh, just like the previous studies, deflasacord was associated with significant lower weight gain compared to the daily prednisone group. Uh, and even when deflasacord was compared with even the intermittent regime, also they were able to find a significant lesser weight gain compared to the intermittent prednisone oh, group. Sorry. Deflasacord significantly better than both the prednisone regimes. And this was the height loss. That is most of the children, when they put on steroid for a long-term regimen, they may lose the height velocity. So again, a significant difference noted between the head-to-head -head comparison between the three groups. And with respect to the other parameters, the emotional stress, behavioral outcome, BP, the echo, all the other parameters, they were not able to show any demonstrable difference. Now, the other um, study uh, parameter was disease milestones. That is the time taken to lose a milestone. So first they studied the time to uh, loss of ability to walk. So in the loss of time to loss of ability to walk in the study, um, total 15 participants lost the ability to walk and 20 children lost the ability to rise from the floor. So we had started children who were self-ambulant and we had 15 participants along the course of study who lost the ability to walk and 20 children who lost the ability to rise from floor. And this definitely was much more in the intermittent prednisone group more than the other two groups. And they found out that there was significantly more number of children in the intermittent prednisone group who lost the ability to rise from floor compared to the deflasacord group. So um, in this also daily regimens faring better than the intermittent prednisone group. Uh, they have also listed a complete list of the adverse profile. So the three main adverse, this is in the terms of incidence, the most common incidence was an abnormal behavior, upper respiratory tract infection and vomiting. And they had graded into mild and more than mild based upon the adverse effects scoring system, which I've already put up. And there was 45 serious adverse effects noted, out of which 10 events in the daily prednisone, 20 in the daily deflasacord, and 15 in the intermittent prednisone group. They found out that out of all these 45 serious adverse effects, they could directly attribute it, they have attributed only three of the serious adverse effects to corticosteroids. That is, um, one they have attributed is the uh, two cases of intervertebral discompression seen in the daily prednisone group. Another was a mildly increase during calcium to creatinine ratio. So three of the serious adverse effects which they have attributed to corticosteroids are from the daily prednisone group. 
and coming to the most common side effects it was noted was abnormal behavior which was uh, seen in 22 so 38 percentage of the children from deflas accord group 34 percentage in the daily prednisone and 36 percentage in the intermittent prednisone no significant differences noted uh, urta was the next uh, common side effect noted um, and vomiting was the third most common side effect which was noted so to summarize all the results in the primary objective analysis we found out that there was a significant difference noted in the time to rise velocity when intermittent prednisone was compared to both daily prednisone and daily deflus accord group that is it was faring less compared to both the daily regimens but no significant differences was noted between the daily regimens with respect to other primary objective um, variables that is the forced vital capacity and the TSQM global satisfaction scale no significant differences noted in the secondary objective analysis among the motor scores which is the 10 minute walk test the six uh, meter walk test and the north star ambulatory assessment there was again better significant improvement noted in the daily regimens compared to the intermittent regimen and in the head to head comparison between the daily regimen no significant differences noted none of the other in the other secondary variables which is the pulmonary cardiac effects behavioral scores they could not find any significant difference among the adverse effects weight gain was significantly less than deflus accord group just like the previous studies compared to both daily and intermittent prednisone group and there was no significant differences noted with respect to weight gain between the two prednisone regimes and slowing of growth was also the least with uh, intermittent prednisone group that is the height velocity was less affected with intermittent prednisone and daily deflus accord surprisingly was associated with the greatest slowing of group and bmi was also significantly greater in the daily prednisone versus the intermittent prednisone group um, and when we look into the loss of ability of milestones there was a significantly higher number of children in the intermittent prednisone group versus the daily deflus accord group who lost the ability to rise from flow so the conclusion which they have come up is that uh, dmd patients treated with daily prednisone and the daily deflus accord compared with the intermittent prednisone uh, had, over a period of three years demonstrated significant improvement with respect to the motor function but no significant difference noted in the two daily corticosteroid regime and also with respect to other uh, parameters of dmd they could not demonstrate any significant difference with the three regimens the safety profile uh, with respect to weight gain deflus accord was better with um, height loss intermittent prednisone was significantly better compared to other regimes so this study actually supports the use of a daily corticosteroid regimen over the intermittent regime so what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the study so main advantage is they tried to study the benefit of different steroid regimens in terms of efficacy and side effects and for that, they had used very well-defined scoring in scales, which they put up in the supplementary data. So they had very clearly defined outcomes. Their adverse effects were well put up. They had showed how to proceed if adverse effects were uh, encountered. And they almost were able to assess all the relevant uh, systemic details with regard to DMD, that is motor function, pulmonary function, cardiac satisfaction, behavioral scales, quality of life skills so a lot of multidisciplinary uh, assessment was done with regard to dmd and it was a well defined study protocol which they put up the disadvantages they could not meet up the sample size which had to be reduced and another major disadvantage is this was supposed to be a double uh, blind study but they had temporarily switched to open label a few participants in few centers were actually given daily practice on regime. So it was not throughout a um, blind, double blind study. And they had said that uh, certain long term side effects of steroids, especially with regard to the bone density, can't be studied over even a three year time period. So a long term study side effects could not be studied. And also, they included only the most frequently used steroid regimens. 
uh, that is the three most commonly used steroid regimens. They could have probably used more. So now for the critical appraisal of the skills program, I have used the uh, CAST RCT checklist, which is based in Oxford. And I tried to answer the 11 questions based upon the critical appraisal. So did the study address a clearly focused research question? Yes, the study had put up a very clearly focused research question. They had well-defined population. That was boys who had a properly genetically confirmed case of DMD, four to eight years of age, not previously on steroids, who were able to independently rise from the floor. They had put up three different regimens of steroids. The outcome was properly defined in terms of motor milestones, various scales, and the safety profile of the three regimens. Now, the randomization was done by computer, which was, and the allocation sequences were concealed from the participants. Uh, the losses were accounted for, and the participants were analyzed in the study groups properly. Uh, the study could not, unfortunately, meet the original, uh, the actual calculated sample size was 300, which was brought down to 225. And further, the number of students, children analyzed was 196. And were the participants blind to the intervention they were given? They were supposed to be blind. It was a double blind study. But unfortunately, 74 of 196 children were switched temporarily to open label daily prednisone due to drug supply issue. This is one of the, probably one of the major flaws of the study. And were the study groups similar at the start of the RCT? Most of the baseline traits of uh, all the three study groups were similar except maybe for the racial uh, uh, trait. That is, for the daily prednisone group, there were more white children compared to other two regimens. So they could have probably tried to balance out the uh, racial uh, traits of the children as well. Now, was there a clearly defined study protocol? Yes. Uh, if any additional interventions were given, were they similar between the study groups? So this they have actually given in the study protocol. That is children who had certain adverse effects. That is children uh, who had a low bone density. Some of them were given bisphosphonates. Children who had gone for cardiac failure, they were given AC inhibitors and uh, beta blockers, which they have already mentioned in the study protocol. Um, and were the follow-up intervals same for each study group? Yes, the follow-up intervals were same for study group, but not all the children were actually followed up for a period of three years. Some there were definitely dropouts. Uh, the power calculation was undertaken. Outcomes were properly defined using scales. The results for each outcome, in including the individual safety, uh, the secondary outcomes were also reported. Um, the data was accounted for. It was done using a two-tailed p-test and the p-values were reported. Uh, the confidence intervals were also reported for the check. Now, were harms or unintended effects reported for each study group. There was adverse effects which was reported. They had done a proper grading of the adverse effects and they had a properly defined algorithm how to go about each adverse effect. Um, so that was uh, definitely documented. Cost effect analysis, they have not mentioned. Now, will the study results help us locally? Are the study participants similar to people in your care? Yes. This study will definitely help us for treating children in our department who come with DMD. And the outcomes are definitely important to our population. And uh, so that will help us to give more output regarding the treatment of the various steroid regimens that should be employed in such children. And they were had reported most of the relevant outcomes uh, different, involving different systems, but not much is still known about the long-term side effects of the steroids. And are there any limitations of the study that would affect your decision? Yes, because of the um, blinding, which was not done properly, probably that is one of the limitations of the study. Uh, regarding resources, uh, we need a proper technical as well as human resources for the proper blinding, for the allocation, for the proper follow-up. We need to employ different tools. There are multiple uh, scales which have been employed for the study of this, uh, for the study, uh, they need proper following up. There should be a proper um, algorithm for the treatment of the side effects. So all that 
accounts for a lot of human and technical constraints and resources. So thank you. So this is the Indian um, group which manages, which is involved in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy case. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, um, Asim Madam, for that excellent presentation. Now I would request Dr. Um, Ramkuti sir to share his thoughts and give his comments as far as this article is concerned. Over to Ramkuti sir. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes sir. Okay, uh, first of all, I think it was an excellent presentation and excellent analysis. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, she made very things very clear. Uh, and uh, as to the paper, I think this is a very interesting paper, uh, very useful in the sense for a clinician, because it addresses a very immediate question of what is the best regime, especially comparing between daily and intermittent regimes. Uh, sorry to interfere, sir. As we yeah. can you stop uh, screen sharing? Oh, sorry, sir. It's okay. Thank you. Sir, requesting please to continue, sir. Yeah, so they are comparing a day, a two daily regimes with uh, intermittent uh, therapy uh, and uh, they have done it uh, in the proper way. So the challenge in this, I will uh, I will not talk about uh, the, you know, the neurological aspects of course, Dr. Mohamed Kuni is here. I am only talking about the design and the study. Uh, first of all, the first question we want to ask is, was it warranted? Because did we really have an answer? Of course, I, I mean, we can't criticize too much because it has been cleared by the ethics committee. So obviously they have taken that into consideration. But uh, I was a bit worried that, you know, some of the uh, children in the one of the groups uh, was doing badly. Uh, was it really necessary to, you know, we, we already had the answer that daily regime is useful. Uh, so maybe, so that's a judgmental issue. Some people, maybe there is a, there is a uh, reason why it was done. So I will leave that. Coming to the statistical and uh, design part, see there are three challenges here. One is, uh, there is what is known as the treatment effect, uh, which means, you know, how do the, the three interventions compare in terms of, so whenever you have more than two interventions, uh, we cannot uh, use the direct comparison. Because suppose you have A, B and C, uh, of course, uh, very naively we might think that A can be compared with B, B with C and C with A. Uh, but the problem is uh, what, what we call in statistics uh, multiple comparisons, which means that if you compare things in the same data over and over again, some of them will turn out to be statistically significant just because of chance. So unless you statistically adjust for that, uh, you cannot uh, take a, so that is one challenge. So I think they have properly done the comparisons. But the second challenge is that there is also a time element because they are measuring over two year period, three months apart or something like that. So which means, you know, the outcomes may go up and down or maybe it is progressing or deteriorating or whatever. So how does that compare? So there is what is known as the period effect. So the period effect and the treatment effect, the two effects uh, may also interact. That is known as uh, statistical interaction. In epidemiology, we also call it uh, effect modification, which means that suppose one treatment is superior to another, A is superior to B. Now, does the superiority increase over time or does it decrease over time or does it remain the same over time? So these things are also important. Uh, whenever we say that you know, A is comparable to B, we are assuming that uh, the period effect is constant in both. So if it is not constant, uh, you have to test for the inter interaction effect and uh, uh, report that. So uh, I assume that it has been done. So I didn't see that actually uh, in my reading of the paper. Uh, so that is one point that I want to flag. Uh, so, and the third point is that they have done multiple outcome measures. It is not just one measure. They have, there is a total uh, measure which they have done, which is very good. But apart from that, they have secondary measures which they have compared. Uh, so when you, again, the whole same thing applies. When you have multiple outcomes and you're comparing the same data with multiple outcomes over and over again, some may go this way, some may go that way just because of chance. So again, you have to 
adjust for that and for that you have to use uh, techniques called multivariate analysis of variance or MANOVA and all that. But uh, I didn't see that in this paper. It's not very important, but if you are going by strict, uh, you know, methodological approaches, uh, you need to do that, um, which I don't think they have done. So that is one uh, uh, deficiency which I, from a methodological point of view, I could point out. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that it is a major criticism, but because their main interest was in looking at the uh, total, uh, the, there's a score which they have compared and that has been compared with the three groups over time. And that part, they, I think they have done uh, very well. And uh, as and also as uh, the doctor uh, did, I mean, she presented the, the appraisal also according to the standard protocol. Uh, of reporting clinical trials and then she did a good job in that also. So on the whole, I think the, this is a very useful uh, presentation as well as a very interesting paper. Thank you. Thank you, Ram Kutu, sir. Now we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Mohamed Funu, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay, Dr. Asmi, I think uh, she has done a wonderful uh, job, both uh, in uh, presenting the paper as well as in analyzing. And she's, she started with the initial uh, aspect of uh, the standard of care of uh, uh, addiction muscular dystrophy. And as mentioned in the paper, as well as uh, in ASME's uh, initial presentation, definitely the standard of care uh, now uh, uh, devices uh, steroids uh, for the management of initial management of uh, 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 that is to prevent uh, uh, or uh, the, the, the loss of ambulation in uh, early situation and that I have also seen because uh, since we are using the steroid for a long time. So the uh, current, uh, the, the, the natural history of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that they, these children will become wheelchair bound by uh, 12 years. But in those patients, what I have, we have seen is that those patients uh, who received the steroids in a regular manner with the uh, 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 monitoring for adverse reactions, Actually, uh, they are ambulant up to 16 to 70 years, but uh, uh, their longevity could not be uh, reduced, and usually they die by 20 to 25 years. So that is the natural uh, course. And uh, one more aspect in the point, uh, the standard of care uh, treatment is the usage of uh, ACE inhibitors for the prevention or uh, at least uh, again, prolongation or uh, delaying the development of uh, congestive heart failure. This again uh, is advised and moreover, uh, uh, the, the role of echocardiography in uh, detecting. But uh, one point I just wanted to highlight or uh, ask uh, in this um, uh, study, uh, one uh, regarding the usefulness of Replisacord. Because even though they have uh, mentioned the efficacies, so, uh, so what is there any efficacy, uh, uh, better usage of Replisacord than in a uh, daily regimen of uh, corticosteroid because of the uh, prednisolone? Because uh, even the, the, the so-called uh, loss of weight gain, uh, which is not uh, that uh, different in the, both the studies, then what is that? Is there any advantage of uh, Replisacord over the Pernisolone. That is one point because it is said that both because they were trying for a, uh, that uh, intermittent uh, uh, because uh, Dr. Amanguti was telling that uh, because uh, intermittent uh, pernisolone would have caused the more uh, adverse reactions and the problems in those uh, that uh, uh, group of children who are receiving that uh, intermittent uh, therapy. But there are a group of people even still uh, advocating intermittent therapy because uh, they think that the adverse reactions of uh, prednisolone can be reduced by this sort of intermittent treatment. So definitely that uh, study, that may have been the reason why the ethical committee also would have given approval for uh, such a study. So definitely that is being practiced in uh, most of the places even now. Second, uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the usefulness of replus accord, because that is one point uh, we have to find out. And second, I think uh, just regarding the confidence interval usage, because in this, uh, they have used 98.6, uh, uh, especially for the weight gain and other things. Uh, is there any difference between usage of confidence interval of 95% uh, with uh, this one? 
Is, is there a, will there be any difference in the ESET score in such situations? I'm good, sir. Sir, uh, can you unmute, please, sir? Unmute, sir. Thank you, sir. This light has gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, usually, uh, they use 95% uh, CI. Uh, uh, I, I really don't understand why they have used a different uh, mode. Uh, if mm -hmm. you use a mm -hmm. higher confidence interval, naturally the interval become wider. So. Mm -hmm. They'll get a better uh, 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 significance in the by that or a difference yeah yeah but when you have limited numbers you know sometimes uh, you are allowed to do that kind of thing so it is not uh, strictly mm -hmm. wrong mm -hmm. okay, thank okay you. regarding that this of uh, usefulness of the pressure code versus a daily printer slot daily uh, can be in for some data from that uh, any better uh, effect or uh, both are same then what is the use of the use uh, what is the use of using the plus code in such patients. Rather, uh, shall we go to Pundis Lawn? Uh, Dr. Asmi, that... Madam, Madam can also contribute. Can you, can you answer that question, Asmi? Sir, the plus code versus uh, daily prednison. Daily, ah. the plus code versus daily prednison. Mm, sir, uh, efficacy actually, none of the, uh, the not, not the present study, and the previous studies have not been able to find out any difference. The difference is always in terms of safety. Adverse reaction. It is in the yes, adverse sir, reaction. It is always in the adverse but, reaction. But in this study also, they haven't found uh, much difference in the adverse rea study reactions but at all. So. But yes, sir, sir, I think sir, the number all is the, uh, 20 all, more with the difference about sir. Uh, all, mean, the, all, the, all the children had behavior problems. All the children had a uh, weight gain. Almost equal, isn't it? Um, there is no, no statistically significant difference was there. Sir, ask me, madam, show, yeah, ask me, madam, I'm showing yeah. the number. Na. Don't, if you want to show there, this one, you can share. Sir, Allah, they were giving percentage, not any clinically. Uh, there is no statistical significant difference between the adverse reactions. They haven't even shown that result even That's because true. there is no difference. That is why. Allah, just if you want to show that uh, once again, you can show that uh, result Sir, there. Be, Weight gain, they have compared between the groups and found out that deflus accord had significantly less weight gain compared to the other two regimens. But no, no, just just show, just show that. Uh, can we share the? Have they found any statistically uh, significant difference in the weight gain? Madam has shown it that actually. Madam's point was there. Um, if possible, That's Madam can uh, share the screen again, Madam. Sir, this the is the one in the secondary safety variables. No, it's no, nice just, to just show that uh, slide of weight gain. I Sir, saw it the first day. Just, uh, I think this uh, slide uh, you haven't uh, shared. Share this slide, we are not seeing. Okay, one second, sir. The one minute. Sir, I think this is the one which they have put up for the secondary safety variable. Uh, they have found out some a significant difference between deflusacot and daily prednisone and deflusacot and intermittent prednisone. See uh, the p-value. Uh, okay, so there is a uh, difference. Uh, but sir, one more thing they're saying was the height loss. That is the yeah, go to the another slide where the that percentage, you know, the three of those reactions they are showing, so you have shown in another uh, slide where the percentage was, ah, this one, yes, you see, uh, they are the, uh, so weight gain is not included in that uh, slide. No, sir, Only the, the, the three main uh, side effects which was noted, adverse effects. Okay, okay. that is almost equal. That so is almost are. equal, sir. Weight gain, they uh -huh. noticed more for the prednisone <laughs> regime, but height loss, they have noticed for deflus accord. Uh, that is again a uh, height loss was there for uh, height loss was there. that was most for deflus accord and least for uh, intermittent prednisone. Mm -hmm. One more actually, slide that is there. one advantage. Uh, uh, one yes, advantage uh, of yes, yes. Uh, water loan over uh, deflus uh, this year uh, prednisone 
is the uh, yes. the uh, the maintenance of the height height. Yes. Sir. That is one advantage there. Mm -hmm. But in this slide, sir, they are telling that twenty events in ten participants in the daily reflexor code group, whereas in daily progesterone group, it was uh, only ten events in seven participants, sir. Sir, uh, this is the serious adverse effects. Adverse effects only. Sorry. Adverse effects itself, they had uh, again uh, classified into mild moderate. Mild disease. moderate. So this is just a list of the serious adverse effects, Excellent. which they have split into uh, the three groups. Sir. Three groups, right? And they found out that probably three of the serious adverse adverse effects were attributable to, to the use of steroids, and those three were actually oh. found in the daily practice group. Okay. Uh, could, could, sir, could it uh, could it be an inference that the flusser coat is safer than uh, that is i think that was what sir was meaning not sir the flusser coat actually it is a perceived uh, thing only because that uh, serious adverse reactions are uh, really uh, the flusser coat also has almost 20 events were there isn't it yes sir compared yes, sir. to 10 events <laughs> so if we take uh, that into consideration also there is only much there is a mild, mild difference. That's all. The weight gain, if you give uh, uh, the dietary advice, exercise given in a proper manner, I yeah. think that can be managed. But anyway, we go for uh, newer drugs. We go for, uh, 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 but the cost is so different. That is the difference between yes. the Prostacort and the Prednisolone. You know, a single tablet will, especially a six, six million tablets itself will cost around uh, 10, 12 rupees. And uh, 40 milligram tablet of uh, Omnacotyl will uh, uh, cost only, I think, uh, three or four rupees. That yes, is it. Hmm. So that much uh, cost difference will be there. Uh, uh, if we have other uh, comments about others. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Can you uh, stop sharing, uh, Dr. Asana, madam? Yes, sir. We have Dr. Kalpana, madam, also with us. Uh, Dr. Kalpana, madam, can you share your thoughts with us, madam? Good evening. Alpana, madam, can we? I request Dr. Kalpana, madam, also to share madam's thoughts. Madam. Uh, Anju, you can call her. Uh, ah, yeah, sure, sir. Sure, uh, sir. Sorry. Can, uh, okay. his comments by Meanwhile, uh, I think uh, our uh, district president and uh, next year's president elect, Dr. Rupuni, madam, is also with us. Uh, Dupini, madam, can you share your uh, uh, thank thoughts, you, madam? Uh, Dr. Anju. And first of all, uh, let me use the opportunity uh, to thank each one of you for the cooperation you extended for the last one year. Last one year was excellent. We, uh, we achieved many things in academics and we could also get many of the awards. And it was a fully satisfying year. And uh, this will be our uh, last online program this year. And uh, with very good attendance and very good discussion, we are uh, reaching the end of the year. And uh, let me invite you all for our program on 26th, which will be the last program and the Christmas and New Year celebration. Please, all of you, make it convenient to attend. Now, Thank you all for electing me for the next year also. And coming to today's journal club, uh, excellent way of conducting the journal club. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ramakuti sir, Patnaban sir, and uh, Anju for conducting this in this manner. And uh, now regarding today's journal club, I'll tell what I felt in my heart. The presenter, excellent. Excellent presentation, that's what I felt. And uh, regarding the paper, um, as Raman Kuti sir said, the first thing we have to think is whether there is a need for such a paper. The second thing I understood from this is whenever we plan for a paper, we'll have to see the logistics first, whether it is feasible, and prepare the logistics first and then proceed. And from Raman Bhutti sir's words, I could get one point. Like whenever we compare drugs, it is not the short-term efficacy. We should think whether it is in the long-term 
the activity increases or the effect decreases. Both we have to take into consideration. So these are the points I gained from today's uh, paper. And uh, whenever we present some paper with flaws, we learn to come out of it. So that way, this paper is very good. And thank you, Punjab sir, Dr. Mimi, Dr. Kalpana, for taking this uh, paper and presenting in our forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. I would also like to express uh, my gratitude to Dr. Mini, madam. As my teacher, madam was a faculty at uh, SAT Hospital. Madam did his neurology, uh, madam's neurology at uh, Srijitra. Uh, madam is uh, today's uh, uh, main person in today's uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, I mean, the presentation, actually. Madam only um, uh, found the uh, PG and uh, found the article and Madam was uh, discussing everything over phone and over WhatsApp and all. But today Madam has some personal reasons due to some personal reasons Madam could not join actually. And uh, um, uh, I thank, I use this uh, uh, opportunity uh, to thank Madam also. Also, sir. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, sir, we would like to hear from you, um, the coordinator of uh, Journal Club, IAP Thirunadwaram. Over to Padmanava, sir. Okay. <laughs> When I meant, uh, this is not my cup of tea. This is uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is one of the most uh, distressing uh, conditions to find out. And uh, I had families in the Gulf. I don't know why they seem to repeat more than here. One, two, three children. And uh, you do the CPK and comes in thousands and you have to break the bad news to them. Well, when I referred patients to the pediatric neurologist there, I did not know the steroids was being given till about a few years back. And today, this journal club gave me a total picture of the thing. I hope in some, when we are giving for three years, even if you give for a longer time, will it not, uh, I just wonder whether it will not prevent the patient becoming wheelchair bound by 16 years or 17 years, or does it lose its effect? How long have we been giving this? That's what I would like to ask Mohammed the Guru. How long have you been giving this to the patients? Well, actually, uh, from, for, 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 a sing, for a single patient or for how many years I'm giving? Yeah, how many question? years? I mean, many, I mean, when you started giving this? Well, actually, we have started way back in 96. So I must remember uh, giving it when I was staying in uh, my another other place. Uh, 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 house that uh, must be in uh, 95 96 time onwards okay. we are giving mm. okay, okay and they do become uh, wheelchair bound by 16 years is it okay i told you ah yes yes, yes. many for uh, those who are uh, continuing like that definitely and everybody has felt that difference because that is only that is one advantage because we can keep them and see the more, most as you said the distressing part of uh, the parents is uh, that uh, uh, making them uh, wheelchair bound. No, that is why most of our uh, uh, dis disabled children parents are not happy to uh, go for a wheelchair, even if they are uh, carrying the child. Because wheelchair means uh, they know they think that the patient is uh, completely gone. So and that to keep them out of uh, wheelchair by at least some medications, definitely it will be a big boost. That way, this is working. Uh, very good. That is why it has come as a part of the standard of uh, care in the management of... Uh, any uh, gene system. therapy been effective? Have you tried yes. anybody? Because there are a lot of reports yes. of gene therapy. So recently also, there are, uh, the one uh, recruitment is uh, going on uh, uh, for uh, Atadurin. Even though you must know that uh, it is not at all, not at uh, approved by uh, US okay. FDA, but it is uh, being uh, approved in uh, Europe and other uh, countries. And uh, Recently, uh, two of my patients were uh, included in the study. Means just the recruiter. Uh, yeah. See, all these gene therapies, the problem is that, uh, again, it just prolongs the agony. Not, uh, it doesn't uh, improve, uh, cure the, pro the process. We are just trying mm -hmm. to convert the Duchenne muscular dystrophy into Becker muscular dystrophy. That's all. Well, but, but sir, the power of the muscles will improve, no, sir? That is what I... Ah, definitely, definitely, definitely. But that will improve the uh, quality of life, no, sir, a little at, yeah. at least. We have to see. I think the long term outcome, etc., uh, not, not that, uh, not that 
uh, what do you call not that promising but still yeah, sir. see that is the way they see that uh, that you, you can go for treatment you know okay thank you sir patnam sir uh, can i uh, i would like to ask uh, one question sir to patnam sir Yes, Patna, sir. Sir, uh, yeah. we were discussing about deflucoat or prednisolone, and, and uh, I mean, uh, clinicians are uh, using deflucoat as well as prednisolone for uh, conditions like asthma. And sir, uh, could you find that in uh, deflucoat? Uh, can you uh, comment on that? Like, uh, do you find less adverse effects with the deflucoat, uh, more effectiveness with the prednisolone uh, in the? I mean, taking oh, acute severe asthma or uh, uh, such a condition as a. Yeah, actually, I am not using deflucoat much in asthma. Therefore, I cannot comment on that. Sir, uh, you mean long term deflucoat? A short time only, sir. Short term, no side effects we have seen either with prednisolone or deflucoat. Nothing, sir. No, okay, see, we give three to ten days and we stop it. See, one thing yeah. is, if you go to Western world, I've been in UK for some time, and you will find that. Patients coming to asthma clinic, many of them are on daily alternate day steroids for asthma. But the asthma is much less severe in our place and hardly anybody is on steroids. There may be steroid inhalation, yes, sir. not on oral steroids. Therefore, yes, I have not found any side effect due to that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Asmi, madam, uh, can I ask a doubt, madam, actually? Yes, sir. Uh, because, uh, uh, madam, in which type of parents, I mean, which parents will you, I mean, should we advise this um, uh, genetic counseling as far as this, uh, DMD is concerned? Like uh, All parents. <laughs> really? Uh, Sir, especially if there is a uh, sibling, we definitely have to give proper counseling. With, I mean, parents, uh, siblings. Parent siblings and there advice. is a previously affected sibling, sir. Uh, we have to definitely, definitely that definitely. Counseling. But what about uh, I mean, um, uh, I mean, if there is no family history at all, I mean, uh, I mean, we can. Uh, there is not. Uh, I mean, urgency of uh, uh, is that what it is needed, madam? Sir, I think de novo mutation has still being reported, sir, but I don't know whether for uh, routine such cases counseling is given. I think usually no. only if there is. Positive family history and yes, yes. antenatal diagnosis possible? Sir, yes, sir. I think if it is previous sibling is there and we know the uh, mutation and proper genetic study is done, I think for antenatal diagnosis also is possible. Yeah. Ask me uh, in all cases, uh, the counseling is required because uh, yeah. okay. when it is a single, uh, the first child itself, especially when the first child is. Uh, uh, having a machine muscular dystrophy, even if there is no family history, you know, because nowadays you know that the family will be a small family. So, you, you, when you ask a family history, the, the mother may, may not be having a brother, even if uh, the brother, uh, if there is a brother for the mother, there again the, the brother may not be having a uh, uh, or a sister. One sister has to be there, you know, then only you can uh, ask for a family history. So what we do is we go for a um, um, gene testing and uh, when the gene is abnormal, then you go for uh, testing in the mother. Mm? And if mother is a carrier, then definitely you know that uh, there is a chance of 50% uh, 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 if uh, uh, it is a boy. If it is a girl, you know that uh, the chance of 50% uh, carrier state. So that definitely, so uh, um, uh, counseling is required and uh, you have to decide on uh, having a next child by uh, doing the genetic testing and if a mother is not a carrier it is well and good uh, that uh, they can uh, easily go for a next child but yeah. definitely in, uh, during pregnancy also they have to go for a testing so genetic counseling the question is uh, and this question was simple uh, whether to give a genetic counseling or not that means genetic test in this case always you have to do a genetic testing in child then you go for the testing in the mother and uh, depending that you can um, uh, decide for the uh, next child. That is it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, one question is there in the chat box, actually. Dr. Shrija has asked, why did they not study the effect of steroids in delaying or preventing development of joint contractures, which is a major handicap long term? I think uh, whether it was not included in the primary or secondary objective, that is what Madam is meaning. Uh, Dr. Asmi, Madam, can you take the question? Uh, uh, one of the uh, secondary variables they've mentioned uh, measuring the range of movements of the joint with goniometer. 
um so probably that was one of the ways they tried to look whether uh, there was contracture or the movement of the joints that was what they have mentioned when i looked into the data set so probably that was one way they had assessed okay you uh, said the, the, range of... see, the thing is that uh, this contractures uh, especially the two things uh, two types of contractures they can have one is the earliest one uh, that happens the iliotibial contracture and second is the t uh, tendoachillis contracture then uh, they will go for a hamstring contractures but all these things uh, will happen once they become they are uh, uh, in a stage of a uh, wheelchair boundness you know when the mobility is not there so these things will uh, happen uh, but here the study period they have included was between 3 to Seven years. So by the time I think uh, there may not be much uh, uh, contractures. That is one that may be one reason they were not uh, mentioning about uh, that in the results also. Mohan, finally, one question. You know, suppose you do you find the mother is a carrier, genetic abnormality. Is there any place in India where we can do amniocentesis and find out whether the Definitely. fetus? Is See, it is being done everywhere. In uh, even in Trivandrum also, we are, we are doing number of uh, cases. Even our uh, Henry is doing. You must be knowing Dr. Henry. He is okay. doing all the centers. Uh, now, even years back, uh, we were doing for all these uh, cases. And uh, well, you do it. Uh, we can uh, send. There is no need. We, we we won't wait for amniocentesis in the first uh, the first uh, trimester. That means at the end of the first trimester itself, you can go for a chorionic will assembly. That is being done by our uh, uh, trained gynecologists. They will do, and then uh, it is it will be sent uh, for the genetic. Already you we know the mutation. You know they will test the mutation. We will get the report, and depending upon the uh, results, uh, parents can de take decisions. Occasionally, some parents may even after the positive. That means a positive report comes. Some parents, at least in uh, I, I know two two parents who refuse to do MGP even after the antenatal diagnosis. Otherwise, uh, people go for uh, most of the time. The uh, next pregnancy will be normal in many of the situations. Or occasionally, only we get a positive uh, report, and uh, most of the people uh, opt for uh, MGP. But rarely, rarely, as, as I have told uh, two times, um, the parents have uh, opted not to do MTP. Now it is available, definitely. So all of, at least all of, uh, uh, everybody must know that antenatal diagnosis is possible, and uh, they all the patients with the most CSMA, DMD, all these cases uh, definitely must be offered. Uh, even uh, tuberous sclerosis, all the, all these conditions, we can offer a. Uh, antenatal diagnosis and definitely we can help them having a normal child. Thank you, uh, sir, for your time and uh, valuable uh, I mean, teachings. Before we wind up, I would uh, like to uh, request Dr. Riyas, sir, to uh, tell a few. Yes, you yes, are requesting fourth or fifth time. It's not coming. I think uh, sir is uh, called I and, uh, um, because I informed sir about Minimado and uh, <laughs> phone is constantly, uh, I mean, engaged, maybe uh, trying to reach madam or so. Can we close then? No, uh, sir. Can, could you, sir, can we wind up the session, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. So thank you. I would like you. to thank. Uh, oh, yes. Hello. Okay, I would like to thank Kunji sir for uh, his time. Sir, we are late at our reach. Sir, we reached Ahmedabad later. Sir, one day the session is very good. So I uh, express my sincere gratitude uh, from myself as from uh, IAP Trandrum. And sir is also uh, part and parcel and a senior person and official of uh, IAP. So, and the uh, Patna sir, uh, Dr. Mini Madam, uh, Dr. Riyas sir, Ramakutti sir, and all the uh, so have joined. I uh, thank uh, from my heart as well as in, when, I mean from IAP Trandrum and I wish all a very great time ahead and uh, till we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I think we must thank uh, Raman Guti for uh, his uh, time and energy being spent for uh, this, uh, this program. Yes, definitely. Definitely, sir. Definitely. Great thing. <laughs> Okay, okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Ask me. Must be Are you asking? Sorry. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for I the opportunity. Uh, Mini also must be congratulated uh, for yes. uh, mentoring.
for uh, this in such a uh, an excellent Thank manner. You. Okay, very good. And Anju Garmani for for the last one you. year for holding this meeting. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, sir. Asmini okay. Madam, thank you for that excellent presentation teaching. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yes, sir. sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night.